Thank you all for coming out tonight and for your interest in these issues. Um, I have been a vegan for many years, since 1985. So those of you who are vegan, thanks for being here. For those of you who are not vegan and curious about these issues, thank you also for being here. You know, one of Farm Sanctuary's organizational values is that we speak to people where they are on their own journeys. We are all works in progress. And even the most vegan, vegan is not perfect. We all make mistakes, we all live on a planet, and we cause harm, oftentimes inadvertently. And it's just a matter of paying attention, being conscientious, and ultimately trying to make better choices as time goes, learning from the mistakes we've made, and trying not to repeat them. And when it comes to our food system, we're making a lot of really big mistakes that have profound impacts on ourselves and on other animals and on the planet. So I will talk primarily about that, but also about some of the things each of us can do to start living in a more mindful, conscientious, humane way uh, that is also healthy for us and healthy for the planet and better for other animals too. So um, I like starting with this quote from Thoreau. It's remarkable how easily and insensibly we fall into a particular route and make a beaten track for ourselves. We are creatures of habit. We tend to do things that we do because we do them. <laughs> Not necessarily because they make sense, and we develop habits. We are social animals. A lot of the habits we develop and a lot of the things we do are things we saw other people do, and so we started doing them. You know, it's been said, monkey see, monkey do. We could easily say, people see, people do. I grew up eating meat and dairy and eggs because everybody around me was doing it and it just seemed like the normal thing to do. But as time went and I started learning about our food system and learning that I could live without causing animal suffering or harming the environment or consuming animal products, I went vegan in 1985. But you know that in 1985, it was a very um, much a minority point of view. It is still a minority point of view today, this whole vegan mindset. But I think there's more awareness now. We're making progress. But just because everybody is doing something and develops the same sorts of habits doesn't necessarily mean that they're healthy, positive habits. And they don't necessarily make sense just because everybody's doing them. And there's another quote I really like by, from Margaret Mead. She said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever does. And so I think the vegan movement at this point is a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens trying to change the world. And most people who are still consuming animal foods don't think very much about it. And so our goal is to encourage people to think about their food chases, choices, make mindful choices, and then do what makes sense. You know, for a long time, smoking, believe it or not, was considered to be not harmful. And in fact, in some cases, people argued that it was healthy because it helped to reduce stress. And this is, again, one of these habits that's not very sensible and causes a lot of harm that we've now come to recognize as harmful. And doctors, by the way, were some of the folks that would talk about how sometimes cigarettes could help reduce stress, so they're not that bad. Um, but, and doctors today, We'll still talk about how sometimes eating animal foods is not only not bad, but healthy. And, and that is starting to change, uh, thankfully. My, you know, I grew up you know, eating animals, although I loved my cat, Tiger. And you know, many of us love certain animals and then eat other animals without recognizing or thinking very much about that massive inconsistency. In some countries, they eat cats and dogs. And people like us who grow up with cats and dogs as our companions are kind of upset to hear that. But in other countries, they don't eat cows. In some places, they don't eat pigs. So which ones we pet and which ones we eat are really quite arbitrary distinctions. And at the end of the day, all of these animals don't want to be harmed. But I was eating animals. In fact, I grew up in Hollywood, California. And when I was young, I actually did commercials for things like McDonald's. I was in the background. My mother got me and my brothers and sisters into the Screen Children's Guild. Um, so again, I just was mindless about it and just doing what everybody around me was doing without thinking. But then when I was in high school, my grandmother told me about how veal calves are raised, how they're chained by the neck in these small crates for their whole lives. 
And so in high school, I said, I don't want to support that. I'm never eating veal. But I was still eating other animals without giving it a lot of thought. Then I came home from uh, something, I forget what it was, but my mother had made a chicken dinner. And there was this dead bird on the plate on his or her back, and I could see the legs and the wings attached. And I didn't eat chicken that night, and I didn't eat meat much for, for a while after that. But that memory of that dead bird faded, and then I got back into the habit that everybody around me was involved in of eating animals and, and, and fell right back into it. Then in the early 1980s, I hitchhiked around the US and got to meet activists. And then I started working with groups like Greenpeace, some Ralph Nader groups. Uh, I learned about Francis Moore LePay's book, Diet for a Small Planet, which was written in the 1970s, and talked about the inefficiency of animal agriculture. I went through some Amish areas in Pennsylvania. And in college, I studied sociology. I heard about the Amish, and I was, in, you know, I, 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 I was under the impression that they were the gentle people, they were pacifists, they didn't support war, things like that. But when I visited Amish country in Pennsylvania, I realized that they weren't really that gentle and they had a lot of very old ideas about how people should relate to other animals, how people should relate to others or each other. And it kind of was a wake up call for me that you know not all is well down on the farm. And so I went vegan in 1985 in 1986, co-founded Farm Sanctuary and felt that it was important to see firsthand what was happening. So I spent a lot of time at Lancaster Stockyards in near the Amish country to witness conditions. I also went to farms and slaughterhouses. But at Lancaster Stockyards, one of our primary concerns had to do with sick animals who were unable even to stand and walk. The industry calls them downed animals because they're down on the ground. And so we started a campaign at Lancaster Stockyards. Uh, and it started after we found this dead pile where they throw the dead animals. But the day we came upon, the, the day I took this picture, the sheep at the far right was still alive and thrown on the dead pile like a piece of garbage. So we took her off of the dead pile thinking she would have to be euthanized. But as the veterinarian started examining her, she stood up and she ended up living a long, happy life. She lived with us for more than 10 years. So that was our first rescued animal. And then we started urging that this stockyard be prosecuted for cruelty to animals for leaving a living animal on the dead pile. But local authorities would do nothing about it. They said that normal agricultural operations are exempt from anti-cruelty laws. And across the US, that's been the case legally. State anti-cruelty laws exclude animals who are exploited in the food industry as long as the practices that are being, uh, that are undertaken are normal agricultural operation. And normal agricultural operation are practices that most farmers start doing. So if they start putting animals in small cages where they can't move, that's a normal agricultural operation and it's exempt from anti-cruelty laws if they start uh, mutilating them, cutting off their tails without painkillers, for example. And if enough of them do it, it's a normal agricultural operation and it's legal. So this is how the industry started doing some really bad things and being allowed to do it. We've worked on that and we've made some progress since then, but that was the state of things. And after working at Lancaster Stockyards to expose this cruelty, it took us seven years and then we, Farm Sanctuary, actually incorporated it as a law enforcement agency in the state of Pennsylvania. And after much effort, we were able to get the stockyard convicted for leaving other downed animals to suffer. When we had tried to prosecute them for leaving Hilda on the dead pile, there was nothing we could do. Uh, legally, local law enforcement would do nothing. The local uh, prosecuting attorney would do nothing. But then we got very active. We educated people in the community. We in incorporated. We had our own law enforcement agent who brought charges, and we were able to have them convicted. And that effort helped to kind of reframe what is a normal agricultural operation. Because once they were convicted, now that was considered to be unacceptable. Uh, so we were very fortunate to be able to make that happen. Uh, but the way it occurred was that um, there were two very sick cows in a pen, and our humane agent, Keith, 
saw this and brought this to the attention of the stockyard. And the stockyard said, well, they're going to slaughter later today, so don't worry about it. So Keith said, okay, well, oh, there's nothing I can do about it legally. So he came back the next day and one of the cows was gone. The other cow was still there in the pen, but now was so sick that she couldn't stand, she was down. So Keith again went to the stockyard and said, what's going on with this cow? And they said that the trucker didn't pick her up. And probably what happened is the trucker came, saw she was too sick to walk, just left her there, took the one that could walk, could walk off to slaughter. So Keith said, well, what are you going to do? And they never gave him an answer. He went back to them time after time during the day. Finally, they said, well, do what you have to do. So Keith called a veterinarian who came to the stockyard, saw this cow who was clearly suffering, was in distress, and the veterinarian euthanized her. The stockyard then sent us a bill for 400 and something dollars saying that cow was worth 400 and something dollars and by euthanizing her, you destroyed her value. So they wanted us to pay 400 and something dollars for this cow. Instead of doing that, we filed cruelty charges against them. And then we went to court and thankfully we were able to have them convicted. So uh, that was the first time a US stockyard was convicted for that sort of action. And since then, we've been working on various other uh, policy reforms. But after a lot of work at Lancaster Stockyards, I started traveling and documenting other conditions. And here's some of the pictures I took. In the upper left-hand corner, you see unwanted male chicks who were discarded at a hatchery that hatches out egg-laying hens. And the reason that these males are thrown away is because obviously they don't lay eggs. But they've also been genetically bred uh, to be egg-laying hens, and they don't grow fast enough to be raised profitably for meat. So they're useless to the egg industry, they're not useful to the meat industry. On the upper right-hand corner, there you see egg-laying hens in battery cages, which is how most of these uh, animals are kept for the egg industry. They're packed so tightly they can't even stretch their wings. The lower left-hand corner is a picture of dairy cows in production um, in the milking parlor. They're pushed to produce about 10 times more milk than is normal. And in a healthy environment, they would live 20 years or so. But on modern dairy farms, they're sent to slaughter after just about three years in production because their bodies are so worn out. And the other thing about the life of a dairy cow is in order for them to produce milk, they have to have a baby. They don't lactate just for the fun of it. They lactate to feed their baby. So they have a baby, the baby's taken away and the, the milk is then sold for people. If the baby is a female, she's raised to become a milking cow. If the baby is a male, he will most likely be used for veal. And then the other picture there in the lower right is a picture of gestation crates, which is how breeding pigs are kept. And these are called gestation crates because it's where they're kept during their gestation period or their pregnancy, which lasts four months. Right before giving birth, they move them into another crate called a farrowing crate, where the mother just has two feet of space. Uh, but when she lays down, there's, uh, there's additional space on the side for the piglets. So when the mother lays down, the piglets can nurse through the bars. Uh, and they're kept there for about two or three weeks. Then the babies are taken away to be fattened for slaughter. They're usually killed at six months old. But right when the babies are taken away, the mothers are re-impregnated, put right back in the gestation crate. So they live this constant cycle of impregnation, birth, re-impregnation. Uh, and with their babies being taken away. So those are some of the conditions that are the norm and have been completely legal. And there are other bad things that happen on these farms that are completely legal. So as you can imagine, seeing this over and over again was really difficult. Uh, and one way that we were able to sort of survive and heal ourselves was by rescuing these animals and watching them heal and recover at Farm Sanctuary. And that's a picture of our farm in Northern California. We also have a sanctuary in Watkins Glen, New York. And we more recently opened one down near the city of Los Angeles so we can get lots of visitors there. And in the coming year or two, we're planning to open another sanctuary in New Jersey with John and Tracy Stewart. Um, and you know John Stewart from The Daily Show. And we're very excited about this because It'll allow us to reach many people in the New York City area with, with stories of our animal rescues and where they came from. 
and just educating people about the food system and the fact that we can live well, in fact, we can live better by changing the way we eat. At Farm Sanctuary, the animals are our friends, not our food. We try to model a new way of relating to these other creatures. You know, as I was saying earlier, we are social animals. We tend to do what those around us do. If all we see is people eating, anim eating animals and farm animals and then not caring for them, that becomes the norm. But when you have examples of people who see these animals as our friends and we care for them like many people care for their cats and dogs, we are creating a new sort of model of how we can interact with these animals. And, and that's a big part of what we do at Farm Sanctuary. And now in the book, Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, there are five tenants we talk about that I'll go into here. And one of the main ones is to live and eat in alignment with your values. Most people are humane. Most people don't like cruelty. But most people are unwittingly supporting this abusive industry by buying animal foods and not thinking very much about it. So oftentimes when the issue of factory farming comes up, people say, don't tell me, I don't want to know. It's too upsetting. And it's because it is upsetting, and we don't like to see others, whether they're humans or other animals, we don't like to see that suffering. And, and, and our empathy and our ability to care for others is, I think, a very important part of our humanity. But today, many people are eating animal products and not eating in alignment with our values. So a key part of what we want to do is just to encourage people to, to make choices that are aligned with our values. The second tenet is to engage in a mindful connection with animals. Studies have shown that when people interact in a positive way with other animals, it actually benefits our own health as well as the well-being of other animals. It helps to lower stress, lower blood pressure, helps to increase the, the um, quality and also the length of our lives. So, and, and this doesn't only mean cats and dogs, it means farm animals as well. At Farm Sanctuary, we have pigs who love to cuddle, we have pigs who totally love belly rubs. Sometimes you go up to these 500 pound sows and because they know that they're in a friendly environment, they're happy to see us. And one of the reasons they're happy to see us is that oftentimes when they see us, it means a belly rub. So you, you walk up to a 500 pound pig, you touch their tummy, they'll flop over on their side. You start rubbing their tummy and they start grunting, communicating to you saying, that feels great, keep going. They'll open their legs and say, you know, keep rubbing my tummy. We have sheep at the farm who also like to be petted. And when you stop petting them and you're ready to walk away, they'll paw at you like a dog will paw at you say, please keep petting me. So these animals communicate and they express what they like and what they don't like. And like everybody, they like to be in a happy environment. They like to be treated well. They don't like to be abused. And we have events at the farm where people get a chance to interact with the animals. Every August, we have the hoedown at our sanctuary in Watkins Glen. People camp out, they pitch tents. Uh, we have a campfire at night. We have various speakers from around the, around the continent, sometimes around the world, who come and talk about what they're doing to prevent factory farming cruelty and help protect animals. It's, it's kind of like a vegan Woodstock. Uh, a little more family friendly though, probably, but it's, 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 it's a really positive event. And we also, every year for Thanksgiving, have a celebration for the turkeys, where the turkeys are the guests of honor not the main course. So again, it's creating an alternative to this mainstream approach to celebrating a holiday with the body of a dead animal in the middle of the table, which is not so easy for vegetarians and vegans to have to uh, experience that. So the celebration for the turkeys and our adopt a turkey program is something that we created back in the 1980s, in fact, to give vegetarians and vegans something to celebrate and it allows us to create a different kind of model for how we interact with these animals. Now, thankfully, there's been a growing awareness about the inhumane treatment of animals on these industrialized factory farms. And that's why a lot of times people say, don't tell me I don't want to know when the issue comes up. And often people will say, I don't buy factory farmed food, I only buy humane meat. 
And it's important to recognize that most of the time, things that are labeled as humane or free range or cage free tend to sound a lot better than they are. Free range, for example, only requires that animals be given access to the outdoors. But access to the outdoors is not defined. So you'll commonly have animals raised by the thousands in basically a warehouse with a small door that goes to a crummy little paddock. So they have access to the outdoors, but they never use it. And that is sold as free range or free roaming. Uh, and so these labels tend to be very misleading. And there is a very strong demand for alternatives to factory farm products, but very few farmers that are actually treating animals very well. And food businesses have a very strong incentive to make things sound very good because consumers are willing to pay a lot more. So the conditions now are such that many consumers are being misled, trying to do the right thing, uh, and being overcharged. And certain food businesses are making a lot of money selling products that sound a lot better than they are. But there are a handful of farmers that actually do treat animals better and let them have a decent life. And this is one of those farmers. His name is Bob Comas, pig farmer in upstate New York. And he would let the animals go out into the woods and then he would take them to slaughter. And people looked up to him as this really humane guy and saying he was doing such a great job. But he got to know these animals. He started looking into their eyes, and he was conflicted about sending them to slaughter. And he started writing in the Huffington Post that people looked to him and called him a really humane guy. But at the end of the day, he was a slaver and a murderer. And he used those terms. Recently, he got out of the pig business and went vegan. A couple of his pigs came to live at Farm Sanctuary. And you know, he told me that even if killing the animals didn't hurt them, and again, it's unlikely that that could happen, but even if that were the case, it would hurt Bob because he had this empathy, this connection, and he could no longer continue taking these animals' lives from them. You know, a big part of this has to do with relationships and creating mutually beneficial relationships instead of extractive relationships. And when we take an animal's life, you know, that is certainly not a mutually beneficial relationship. And oftentimes people will say that these animals had a good life and they only had one bad day. And what's wrong with that? Well, killing is violent and it does something to the animals, obviously it, it ends their lives, but I think it also does something to people. I was uh, talking with a farmer when we first got our farm in upstate New York, and he talked about how he had these cows and they had calves, and the calves got to nurse from the mothers and they got to enjoy their life. And then one day, this farmer went out to the pasture where the calf was born and, and raised and grew, and he sneaks up behind them with a gun and he shoots them in the back of the head, and then they're gone. And he said, what's wrong with that? I said, well, you know, sneaking up behind somebody with a gun isn't a particularly pleasant idea to begin with, but the mother has now lost her offspring. That animal is now deprived of the ability to enjoy life. Any friends that that individual had are now going to miss their friend, and it's unnecessary violence. If we can live well without, without causing unnecessary harm, why wouldn't we? And... Um, if you think about it, the word humane and the word slaughter don't fit very well together. So that's what I say when it comes to these sorts of discussions, recognizing that animals that are raised by somebody like Bob Comas are in much better shape than animals raised in factory farms. And we encourage people to take steps and to make decisions that they feel comfortable with at any given time. But at the end of the day, uh, this becomes sort of a fundamental question of whether or not these animals are there for us to eat. And as a longtime vegan, I, I, I think that we can actually do better by not eating them. And so the, and that's Bob's uh, farm. A little while later, he started growing plant foods to be sold. So that's the direction I think a lot of things can start going and are starting to go. So the third tenet is to engage in a mindful connection with your food. 
And this is actually one I need to do a little bit better with. Eating slowly, savoring your food, appreciating it, uh, and listening to your body as well. Um, in recent years, I've started doing marathons. I've done a few triathlons, including an Ironman. So I've done a fair bit of training for these things. And so I've had to really pay more attention to eating nutritious food that can fuel that sort of athletic activity. And I think paying attention to our bodies and eating slowly. When you eat slowly, you recognize when you're starting to get filled up. Whereas if you eat too fast, you go to a certain point where you're full and you don't know it yet, and then it catches up with you. So this is where eating slowly is a good idea. Chewing your food is a good idea, savoring it, and also buying food that comes from farms that are, have rich soil and nutrients. Uh, you know, organic food, I think, is better than conventional food. I sometimes compare organic food and conventional food to like vinyl records and CDs, where you have kind of like a much richer sound and a much richer uh, uh, food with micronutrients to one that is fairly thin and doesn't have all that kind of depth. Uh, and we are what we eat. Uh, eating food that is nutritious and does have micronutrients that comes from healthy soil is going to have a lot of qualities that food that is quickly produced with chemical fertilizer uh, and soil devoid of life, uh, it's not as rich and it's not as nutritious. And eating fresh food is also a very good idea because it has not lost its nutrients. You know, the more processed something is, the more likely it is to um, be less nutritious. And, and this is something, you know, again, I'm continuing to work on. I travel a lot and sometimes I'll, I'll eat food that's not ideal, but I'm doing a lot better than I used to. When my first book came out back in 2008, I was out talking about it and talking about being vegan, and people would ask, well, what do you eat? And at the time, I ate a lot of noodles with margarine and salt. And people asked me, and I said, I, I grab a handful of noodles, put it on a plate, throw some margarine, some salt, zap it in the microwave. And a lot of people looked at me kind of, eh, that doesn't sound so good. So I figured I better start representing a little better there. <laughs> so that is part of what I'm trying to do. And in my last book, uh, Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, I include 100 recipes from some of the top chefs in North America who provide amazing examples of the kind of food we can eat as vegans. For years, I've been very happy just to see the word vegan on a menu but increasingly now, I'm feeling if I see the word vegan on a menu, the food better taste good because there is sort of a prejudice against it. You know, people are anxious about this. They're afraid they're not going to like the taste of the food. They've possibly had some vegan food they didn't like. And if somebody tries, you know, one vegan dish and it doesn't taste good, they're very quick to say, I tried vegan food, I don't like it. Uh, but I've also seen many times when people have tried a tasty vegan dish, and they'll say, boy, if it was like this, I could go vegan. So showing how tasty this food is, is really important. So anybody here who is a cook or a chef, I encourage you to really use those skills and, and, and share food with friends, share food with coworkers, bring food and, sh and, and you know, bring cupcakes to work and give them to people, you know? And, and that is, I think, one of the reasons that the vegan movement is moving forward at an accelerated rate right now because there's great vegan food and people are recognizing that you don't have to give that much up. And it's important to know where our food comes from and again to support local farms. In different parts of the world, there's more or less vibrant farming communities, but people can actually grow food in their own communities. There's a very big urban farming movement now, um, community-supported agriculture, community gardens, there's an activist in LA who says that growing your own food is like printing your own money. And so, and he was actually planting vegetables in Los Angeles in these uh, median strips and the city tried to stop him, but he kept doing it and he ultimately won the right to do that. So growing food can be very empowering and, and it connects us to our sustenance. And it's, it's a pretty important relationship that we have with food. And it's also very emotional. And 
there's a lot of issues around food, needless to say, but eating wholesome food uh, can change people's lives. You know, eating food that makes us sick doesn't make sense. But in the US, and, and I think here also in Canada, we eat, eat food that makes us sick. It's been estimated that we could save something like 70% on healthcare costs in the US by shifting to a whole foods plant-based diet. 70%, that is massive. Um, so the fourth tenet of living the farm sanctuary life is to eat plants for your health. Well, if you look at our bodies, <laughs> you know, we are much more herbivorous than carnivorous. And a natural carnivore has a very short intestinal tract because meat is a putrefying piece of flesh and it has to get through us quickly. For human beings, it can take days for meat to get through our system. And can you imagine what a piece of putrefying flesh looks like after three days, 98.6 degree moist environment, right? It's not, it's not a pretty sight. And various cancers like colon cancer have been linked to our consumption of meat. Heart disease, one of the top killers, is linked to our consumption of animal products. And so eating food that is healthy makes a lot of sense. If we were natural carnivores also, we would salivate when we saw a dead or dying or injured animal. But we don't tend to do that. And one of the people I quote in the book, Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, uh, who wrote a book a number of years ago, says, if you take a child and put him in a room with an apple and a rabbit, <coughs> And if he eats the rabbit and plays with the apple, I'll buy you a new car, right? <laughs> you know, we're not inclined to go tear things up that are alive. We're, ten, you know, inclined more to go cuddle that rabbit. And that's really a, a healthier human approach, I think, and a healthier human quality. Because if we're going to cuddle the rabbit, we're going to more likely cuddle other people, too, and be more friendly as opposed to violent. Violence creates more violence. Kindness creates more kindness and health. So here's the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics talking about how eating meat-free is associated with benefits like lower body weight, less heart disease, less cancer, lower cholesterol, lower blood pressure, lower rates of type 2 diabetes. And here's their statement talking about how appropriately planned plant-based diets are healthful, nutritionally adequate, may provide benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. So there's a real move now recognizing that the way we eat has massive impacts on our health. Michelle Obama in the US has, I think, done a very good job at promoting more plant foods, uh, but we still have an awful long way to go there as well as here. So the fifth tenet is to eat plants for the health of the planet. And this, thankfully, is starting to get much more attention. The way animal agriculture is one of the top contributors to the most serious environmental problems our planet faces. 35% of the planet's ice-free surface is devoted to animal agriculture. So we have prairie lands that have been turned either into cropland or pasture. We have rainforests that are being cut down. We have vast acreages that are being destroyed so that we can grow corn to feed animals or soybeans to feed animals. If we grew these crops and ate them directly, we could feed something like 10 times more people. It's crazy that we're wasting so much energy because, you know, plowing these fields and adding the petrochemical fertilizers and adding the seeds and then harvesting that um, takes an awful lot of energy and water and, and other resources. Uh, so so it, it's completely inefficient and unreasonable and irrational. In terms of water, half of all the water used in the U.S. goes to raising animals for food. Part of this has to do with the crops, but part of it also has to do with uh, giving the animals water while they're alive. And part of it goes into the processing at slaughterhouses, where you have these operations that use water to clean constantly because of all the blood and the guts that are part of this process. So water is used in a big way in animal agriculture. And finally, the livestock industry is a huge contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. The United Nations talks about how it contributes more than the entire transportation industry. Um, there was also an article in the New York Times a few years ago called Rethinking the Meat Guzzler, in which 
uh, the author compared the amount of fossil fuels needed for a meat meal versus a vegetarian meal. He found it took 16 times more fossil fuels for the meat meal versus the vegetarian meal. So eating plants instead of animals makes all the sense in the world. It's more aligned with our values instead of killing animals and participating in violence that doesn't feel very good. It's more aligned with our interests instead of eating food that makes us sick or destroys the planet. So if people start making choices that are aligned with our values and interests, we will start seeing a huge difference. And the good news about it is that all of us have control over what we eat. There are many things in this world that are outside of our control. And we feel, in many cases, helpless to do anything about it. But when we make thoughtful food choices, you know, we can feel empowered and we can make a big difference. And so for people who are not vegan, we encourage certain simple steps that can help take people down a path that is in that direction. First is meatless Mondays. You know, one day a week going meatless, what this does is it helps people become familiar with uh, what they can eat instead of animal foods. And sometimes it's not a very big shift. You can have spaghetti and meatballs, for example, but instead of using meatballs from animals, you can get veggie meatballs. So it's pretty much the same dish, it feels the same way, but it can be vegan, and it's not that hard. Another thing is that we encourage people to just research what is happening, and there's so much avail information available now online where you can learn about industrial egg production or, or, or meat production. But you can also Google vegan lasagna and get all kinds of great recipes. So there's lots of information now available at our fingertips that can empower us to live in a way that is aligned with our values and interests. I think it's important to try to support local businesses, shopping at farmer's markets. This connects us more closely to the source of our food because, for example, when you go to a, a supermarket, at, you're further distanced from food. The food is not as fresh, it's not as nutritious. And some of the labels, like cage-free or humane, are more likely to be misleading. Whereas if you go to a farmer's market, you can actually talk to the farmer and possibly even visit the farm and see what they're doing, whether to animals or in their plant production practices. So connecting to the source of your food that way, I think, is very helpful. Choose substitutes. You know, in addition to meatless meats, there are now a, a variety of different kinds of plant-based alternatives to cow's milk in mainstream stores. So substituting is a really good way to get animal products off your plate and, and, and support a different kind of industry. And if you get a chance, we'd love you to come visit Farm Sanctuary, look into the eyes of one of our cows or pigs or chickens or turkeys or other animals, mm -hmm. recognize that they are not that different than cats or dogs, that they want to be our friends, not our food, and that choosing to live in that way is not only good for them, it's also good for us, and it's really good for the planet too. And I encourage you to think about the, getting the book maybe, Living the Farm Sanctuary Life. If you want information on Farm Sanctuary, check out our website, which is farmsanctuary.org. We also have a Facebook page, we have Twitter and Instagram. We are social animals, we learn from those around us. Most of us grow up eating meat because most people around us are eating meat. For those of us who have decided to eat plants instead, we now become examples for others and they can start thinking along this line and it's important to support each other. Uh, even in making small steps, if somebody says I'm not eating veal, that's a great thing, it's a, a positive step. Any step in a more humane direction is I think worth supporting because small steps often lead to bigger steps over time. But another way we as social animals can make a big difference today is through social media. It's never been easier to share information, including information about the cruelty of animal agriculture. So that's good for people to see so they're aware of it. But it's also important, I think, not to overwhelm people with too much of those ugly pictures because at a certain point, people start shutting down. I think it's important to show solutions. So while people need to realize how bad things are, and that's where showing these videos and pictures that are available you know, online can be valuable. It's also important to show that there are things people can do to be empowered to make a difference. 
instead of seeing a horrible thing after horrible thing after horrible thing, and being afraid to try something different and feeling that you're unable to eat and live in a way that's not gonna to contribute to that. So it's so important to empower people to live in a way that is aligned with their values and interests. And that's why in this book I included so many recipes, helping people and showing people how to do this. There's uh, tips and suggestions for setting up your vegan kitchen. There's information about substitutes for different commonly used animal products that are plant-based. So just providing people tools to start breaking some of the old unhealthy habits and start developing better habits that are, again, more compassionate and also more healthful and more sensible. So I guess I'll just close it with that and open it up to questions, comments, anything anybody wants to talk about, I'm happy to talk about. So thanks, everybody.